Hi, everyone. Welcome. Glad you could join us today. So uh, there's still people uh, joining us, so we'll give people a moment to, to show up. But uh, this is the uh, webinar for Deliberate Practice and Psychotherapy sponsored by PPRNNet. Um, so everyone here should be PPRNNet members. It's kind of cool. We got a nice community here. Uh, as we're just waiting for people to get started, um, let's see, can you go ahead and uh, type in a um, comment here? Uh, so if you open the chat window and uh, type in a chat with where you're uh, calling in from today, just so we can see where everyone is. Um, and if you see right above where you can type in the chat, there's an option to make it to all panelists and attendees. And that way everyone can see uh, your chat. So, and please let me know also, can you see the slides that I'm showing? I just wanna make sure that those are, the slides are showing. Um, oh, great, we got uh, uh, Valeria from Melbourne. Excellent, Cindy from Toronto, Ottawa, great. Uh, please uh, type in where you are and uh, Toronto great please uh, set set the uh, there's a right above where you type in it says two colon and if you can set that to all panelists and attendees and then type in your city that will make it so that everyone can see uh, where you're joining in from and you might have to do that each time you type in a chat and that'll let us all kind of communicate together uh, great, Montreal, Toronto, uh, great, um, cool, yeah, there you see it, all panelists and attendees, it's right above the chat window, it, it can be a little tricky to find it first. So, uh, welcome everyone, it looks like uh, we've got uh, folks from uh, across uh, Canada, and then also from uh, Melbourne, which is really cool. Um, one of the cool things about uh, doing these workshops and webinars and deliver practice is uh, getting a response from around the world. It, we, it, it's really obvious how therapists around the world are all kind of struggling with the same challenges and, and have the same goals, which is it's really highlighted the, the universal nature of our community. So that's really cool. Uh, hi, Eva. Um, great. Okay. So. Uh, as I said, today's webinar is on Deliberate Practice for Psychotherapy. My name is Tony Rumanier. I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical faculty at University of Washington. Today's webinar is uh, on the material in these books, particularly the two books here on Deliberate Practice. Um, and I'll be referring to information. There's more information that I can present in the webinar today, so I put a lot of extra resources on the website below, the dp4therapist.com has a lot of information um, that goes beyond the webinar. So, uh, welcome, Jean. Welcome, Angelo. So, uh, today's webinar is sponsored by PPRNNet. Um, you all remember, so I don't have to tell you what that is, but uh, it, it's just a wonderful uh, organization, very groundbreaking, and I, I wanna say thank you uh, to George Tasca for uh, inviting me to do this and uh, organizing this. So it's really exciting to see PPRNet grow really quickly and um, into this uh, large community of therapists. So that's really cool. Um, so just about today's webinar, uh, a few things. First of all, no one else can hear or see you. Um, they can only hear or see me. So everything you are saying or doing is uh, private. Um, if you type into the chat window, if you set it to all panelists attendees, other people can see what you type in. So please don't type in anything confidential like about clients or anything like that. Uh, and let's see, I'm gonna encourage you to ask questions and participate through the chat window throughout the webinar. Uh, this webinar is only for therapists and trainees. Uh, it does contain some um, emotionally evocative uh, components. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and may be used uh, later for training purposes. Um, and uh, yeah, please don't share confidential information in the chat. If you have any questions, please type them in at any time in the chat window. 
So I'm going to encourage you to participate. Uh, there are experiential exercises in the webinar so you can get a taste of deliberate practice yourself. Now, the exercises involve uh, videos that are uh, emotionally evocative, it, intentionally. They're meant to present a strong stimulus. Um, that can sometimes stir up anxiety. Uh, and so if you notice your anxiety going up, uh, stress going up, tension, that kind of thing, if it gets anywhere near too much, just you know, feel free to pause the video, turn aside, do something else. You can ask, type in a question is a good way. Just basically whatever you do to downregulate your anxiety. The same way you, you know, we help clients learn to kind of uh, respectfully attend to their anxiety. It's important that, that we do as well. In deliver practice, we're trying to find the, the threshold of our capacity and work right there. Not at a theoretical level, but at, at a basically a physiological level. So that makes it extra important that we be very respectful, self-compassionate to our uh, internal experience. Uh, and I do encourage you to have a poster or pad or something so you can take notes as we, uh, as we go on. So uh, more people are joining us. Uh, so for the new people that just joined, can you please open the chat window? Now look where you can type in a message right above that, just like a quarter inch above that or a centimeter above that uh, is uh, you can see it says all panelists. If you can change that to all panelists and attendees and then type in the city where you're calling in from. That way, uh, what you type will be shared with everyone. It can be a little tricky the first time. So uh, great, Sandra from Toronto, welcome. So um, I will uh, charge ahead here, and I think people will just be joining us as we continue. So before we get into deliver practice, I'd like to take a moment and uh, talk about what brought me to deliver practice. Um, when I started my psychotherapy training, uh, first of all, who recognizes what movie this is from? Please type it into the chat window and make sure to set it to all panelists and attendees. Uh, we'll see if anyone recognizes this movie here. Um, as people do that, uh, yes, Goodwill Hunting, right? As I, when I, um, no, Dead Poets Society, that's a different Robin Williams movie, but <laughs> good guess is Goodwill Hunting. When I became a therapist, I wanted to be something like Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting. I'd help my clients have these remarkable emotional breakthroughs and unlock their potential and discover themselves and, you know, just like in the movie. The good news is that uh, I was able to help uh, roughly half of them have a, a really positive experience. Unfortunately, uh, as I proceeded through my training, I got the feeling that not everyone was having a positive experience. And as I started collecting my outcome data, I found that actually roughly about half of my clients were not benefiting from therapy. There were a bunch that would just stall, like not improve. Uh, uh, some that would drop out, and some that would even deteriorate, get worse from treatment. Now, at first, I was horribly embarrassed about this, and I was ashamed I didn't want to tell anyone, but as I started to read the psychotherapy outcome literature, the research, I found that these, this outcome day is actually quite average across the field, that I was not you know, a bad therapist, I was just a perfectly average therapist. Um, and, and this is at, when you kind of aggregate all the outcome data across you know, all the different types of mental health, all the different populations, we have roughly these results. Now I wanna emphasize these results are not bad. There are many medical you know, professionals uh, that would kill for these results. Um, on average, we do a pretty decent service for fairly low cost uh, with a fairly low uh, chance of you know, harm or deterioration, side effects. However, uh, I was not satisfied with a 50% success rate. Um, so I went on a mission to improve. Two of the methods I used uh, to improve you might be familiar with. The first is I bought a boatload of psychotherapy books. You can see some of them uh, behind me. Um, and I read them cover to cover, many of them multiple times. I'm sure many of you also have a decent sized uh, library. Um, and then I attended a lot of workshops. Now, 
these were really good for teaching me about the theories of psychotherapy. I learned a lot about the models of psychotherapy. I got really good at talking psychotherapy. I could write really good psychotherapy. Um, but if you looked at the actual videos of me doing psychotherapy, it did not match the quality of my writing or talking about it. Uh, so basically, I was gaining a lot of intellectual knowledge, theoretical knowledge about psychotherapy, but I wasn't acquiring the the skill, the behavioral skill to actually do it, particularly with more challenging cases. Um, perhaps the, 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 the most important part of my clinical training was clinical supervision. Now, I've done some research in clinical supervision, and one of the cool things I've discovered is, so you know there's all these battles in psychotherapy about like, which is the best model? Is it like CBT or dynamic therapy or EMDR, or, you know, systems or, or what have you? There's actually one point of agreement across every model of therapy as far as I can tell. There's no debate. They would all agree that clinical supervision is an essential, if not the essential method for clinical training. Everyone agrees on this except, unfortunately, supervision researchers. Those of us who have looked at uh, the clinical supervision uh, outcome data uh, have found that, unfortunately, clinical supervision does not reliably uh, improve the client's outcomes, which I would argue, and many would argue, is really the, Michael Ellis called it the acid test of supervision, is are the client's benefiting from the supervision. We know supervision can benefit trainees, it can reduce anxiety, it can you know, help professionalization, that kind of stuff, but it doesn't reliably reach through and help clients. Now, in particular, I noticed there were certain um, clinical skills that I ended up calling supervision resistant. Now, this doesn't mean I was resisting supervision. I was desperate for supervision. I, I was paying a lot for supervision after I graduated. But there are certain challenges I kept bringing to my supervisors, and I, had, I was lucky, I had really good supervisors, um, that though they gave me the really good advice based on my videos, I just wasn't able to implement their advice. My skills were not improving in those areas. And so what, what are some examples? Um, one example is uh, when I noticed that I have certain ruptures with certain kinds of clients. For example, clients um, that uh, would, would get angry at me. And um, I knew what I was supposed to do to repair the rupture, theoretically, but I would get scared basically emotionally and freeze or detach or end up arguing back with the client. You can imagine how helpful that was. And I would show the video to my supervisor and they'd point out what I did wrong, what I should do better. And I would agree with them, but I, it would happen just week after week after week, I'd make, keep making the same mistake. And so it's like, I wasn't, I wasn't getting better at this particular skill or this particular challenge in psychotherapy, regardless of how many hours of supervision I threw at it. Now, I want to ask you, can you identify any quote unquote supervision resistant skills or challenges you've faced? These are challenges you've had with your clients that keep repeating, even though you get really good supervision on that particular skill. And if you feel comfortable, please you know, write it into the chat window. Make sure to set it to all panelists and attendees. Um, I, I would argue that every therapist should just, we should just have in the back of our mind, like our top three clinical challenges, like our threshold, our skill threshold, what we're working on next. Not, not to feel bad about ourselves, but just like if you're a basketball player or a chess player or a musician, you'd have in the back of your mind, like what are your weaknesses or, or what, are your, what are your skill thresholds? So while, while you kind of write that into the chat window, I'll, I'll give another example. You know, uh, good therapy is a blend of, on one hand, encouragement, you're encouraging the client. On the other hand, you're challenging them, you know, when necessary. And ideally, you're kind of carefully, you know, customizing that blend for each client. I kept finding that I would be like all of one or the other. So I'd be all encouraging, which, you know, wouldn't help a lot of my clients that needed to like face some hard truths. Or I'd switch over to be like all challenging, which... <laughs> was like even worse, clients would get offended or 
you know, feel bad about themselves, depressed or drop out or something. And my supervisor would point it out like, oh, you actually need a good balance of encouragement and challenge. And I'd be like, I know, I know, I know. And I, we'd go over week after week after week. And uh, I, I just couldn't implement it. It's like I understood it, but I wasn't able to do it. So can anyone think of any clinical challenges you've had that uh, are kind of supervision resistant or training resistant? Kind of think about, think about that. And go ahead and type it in if you can. I'll go to another example. Um, there are clients um, which I found provocative. Um, and for example, uh, early in my training, I had a client who uh, said she was attractive, attracted to me. And I, I, I got really nervous. I was like, oh my God, is this okay? And my supervisor explained to me like, you know, it's totally fine. This happens in therapy, da, da, da. You know, just maintain boundaries and you can, you know, proceed and so on and so forth. But it was so, you know, provocative to me. I got so nervous and tense about it that I just wasn't really able to help her as much. And even though we talked about week after week after week. And so this is an example of kind of supervision resistant skills uh, that uh, in my case, at least there's been quite a few of them. So please continue to think about it. if you think of any, put them into the uh, chat window. So um, this all brought me to the deliberate practice. So what is deliberate practice? Let me ask you a question here. Uh, who here has, uh, all right, Sandra wrote one in, trying to meet client well, but where they are while not personalizing their lack of progress. Yeah, so that's a really good one. So that's actually two different skills, which are tough together, which is, so attuning with the client kind of at their capacity level, which is not as easy as it sounds. Um, and then simultaneously, uh, you know, not being like, oh, it's my fault that like they haven't moved further. I, I, I'm guessing other people here have had that experience, right? I mean, we're in this field where some clients charge ahead and some go really slowly and it's hard not to take that personally. So Cindy says, uh, a client says she wants to change but doesn't put any changes into practice and keeps saying the same things. Yeah, so basically anything having to do with mixed motivation uh, I found particularly challenging. And I understood in theory, you know, I memorized the stages of change and the, you know, all that kind of theory. But when I'm sitting with someone who's low motivation um, or, you know, in the contemplation phase, how I react to them can be quite different than what the textbook suggests. So good, good examples. All right. So another question here. Uh, who here has played a sport, uh, a sport that you receive coaching, like you got a team you know, a team sport or something like that. Please type in your sport in the chat window. It, you know, it could have been in school, high school, college, anything like that. Great karate, basketball, tennis, trampoline, excellent, judo, swimming, excellent. Okay, now imagine you went to your coach and golf, basketball, excellent. And um, imagine you went to your coach and said, uh, coach, you know, I really love, Tennis, karate, basketball, you know, you name it. And uh, in fact, I think I want to play professionally one day. I think I've got a knack for this. I just don't have time for practice. Uh, how about uh, I read about a, a bun I read a lot of books about tennis, basketball, karate. I maybe watch videos of you doing it a lot. I write some papers about it. And then I just go to a lot of games or a lot of meets. I, how about... Maybe what if I do a thousand hours or two thousand hours of games or meets and just watch a lot of videos and read and write papers about it? Can that help me get to a professional level of skill? What do you think your coach would say? Right, there'd be there'd be no <laughs> you throw the ball at me exactly. Uh, there's a there'd be no chance, no chance at all. There's no sport, right? Uh, Badman, excellent. <laughs> You're fired. Great. Yes, exactly. Now, a, a separate question. Who here has uh, studied a musical instrument, like with a teacher or coach? Please type in the musical instrument you've studied. Could be any musical instrument. Oh, piano, blah, piano, banjo, piano, excellent. Violin, excellent. Now, uh, dancing, that counts. <laughs> Accordion, excellent. Um, 
So, uh, oh, and uh, Peter McLean, Dr. Peter McLean, when you put something in, please, uh, you see there's a little bar that says all panelists. If you change that to all panelists and attendees, it's right over uh, where you type in your chat, then it will go to everyone. Thank you. I know it's hard to, uh, it's hard to see there, but okay, great. So imagine you went to your, um, uh, your music teacher and you said, you know, teacher, I love the piano. I love the guitar. <laughs> I love the accordion. <laughs> um, in fact, I think I want to be a professional accordion player someday. Um, I just don't have time for practice. Right. I mean, who, who could possibly do this? Um, uh, how about I read a, bun a bunch of books about the accordion. I, I watch a lot of videos of you and other masters playing the accordion. And then I just perform one or 2000 hours of recitals. Could, could that get me to a professional level of skill? What do you think the teacher would say? Yeah, there, there's no way. There, there's no way at all. So I, I would guess that everyone here today has engaged in deliberate practice. All right, that's a practice for who has engaged in deliberate practice in at least one domain, probably multiple domains. Deliberate practice is a term coined by Kay Andrew Erickson and colleagues in the, um, yes, some benefit, but not enough, Cindy, great. Um, uh, we will, we're gonna get to that. And Patricia, your comment, it would take 40 years. We're gonna get to that. Not necessarily, uh, just performing for 40 years can get you to competence, but it cannot, get to professional level in most other fields, right? If I pick up an accordion and just like play myself for 40 years without getting professional coaching, I would not be a professional. I could be a very accomplished amateur, but not a professional. Um, so, uh, Kay Ander, Erickson and colleagues um, thought of the term, uh, came up with the term deliberate practice. Uh, they are researchers in the science of expertise. So psychologists that study how uh, professionals attain their skills across a wide range of fields. And they went to a uh, music, classical music conservatory in Germany, and they asked classical violinists to fill out diary cards on their training activities. And then they sorted all the diary cards um, by the skill of the violinist. They were looking for any training activities that reliably uh, predicted the skill of the violinist. And they found only one. There's only one training activity that was reliably significantly associated with the skill of the violinist. And that was the number of hours they'd engaged in solitary deliberate practice. Now, we're going to learn later, there's nothing magic about the solitary part. But the deliberate practice part is very important. They found that the best violinists had all engaged in at least 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. Malcolm Gladwell used this number to coin the term the 10,000 hour rule in the book Blink to suggest professionals need 10,000 hours of practice to achieve expertise. Now they've since found there's nothing magic about the number 10,000, it can be fewer or more, but suffice to say it typically takes thousands of hours of practice, not performance, but practice to achieve, achieve expertise across a wide range of fields. So what is deliver practice? There's five basic components here. First, observe work. This is something most therapists get in graduate school uh, where their supervisor might observe a live session um, or uh, listen to an audio of a session or observe a video of a session. They get expert feedback. That's something we typically get in graduate school, which is where supervisors give us feedback on our work. Notably, after we're licensed, that typically stops. Uh, you know, there's a joke you can see the last time your therapist had a meaningful work uh, performance review by looking at the graduation date on their, uh, you know, graduate certificate. The third step is setting small learning goals. Now that is something we typically do not do in psychotherapy. We talk about grand things like build a big, better alliance, which is like telling a basketball player to, you know, score more. Um, uh, it should be small learning goals. We're going to talk about that. Engaging in behavioral rehearsal, that's typically something we don't do in psychotherapy. And then assessing performance, that's something we do in a mixed, uh, a mixed level. Now this process continues throughout a whole career, right? If you know professional musicians, professional athletes, they don't stop practicing. In fact, they, they practice more the higher they get in their career. If you have any questions, please, uh, please put them in the chat window. Now, uh, colleagues and I have been experimenting with using deliberate practice to improve uh, psychotherapy skills. 
And this is a model I've developed here. Oh, so if you email me when this is done, I will send you the slides uh, to the presentation and the PDF here. Uh, you are welcome to use these slides in whole or in part in your own teaching, in your own workshops, whatever you want. I just want to get the ideas out there. So um, just email me afterwards. My email here, I'll type my email into the chat window here so you have it. And it's uh, at the end as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go over this kind of as a, later in the webinar, but I want to highlight something right here, which there's two broad domains that we look at when we're doing deliver practice for psychotherapy. The first is skill acquisition. So skills, psychotherapy skills are like attuning with a client um, or helping a client achieve a, a specific goal focus uh, or you know, appropriately balance, balancing support and challenge like we were talking about um, or maintaining self-reflective capacity while a client is having a provocative experience. Uh, those are specific skills. Now, just as important is that we built the capacity to use those skills while we are helping clients that we find challenging. This is something that it, it's been recognized since the time of Freud. Basically, every model recognizes that therapists must have kind of a, a heightened psychological, emotional capacity to do the hard work of being a therapist. But very few of the models tell you how to build that. So it's like if you wanted to be a professional basketball player and they said, oh yeah, it's super important. You have to be in the top physical shape, but then there was no physical conditioning <laughs> included in the training, right? Uh, and, and so, uh, or becoming a professional musician and they didn't teach you how to tune your ear or, or whatever it is. So, so we're, gonna try, we're gonna pay attention to both, both, both acquiring the skills and then building your capacity to use the skills, all right, in challenging situations. So, Let's jump right into a demonstration before we go any further. So you can get a taste of what I'm talking about here. So hold on a second. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, uh, this sample exercise is gonna be working on the skill of maintaining your self-reflective capacity. This is being aware of what's going on inside you in your inner world uh, while you're doing therapy, particularly with a client that you find provocative, that stirs up a strong reaction, that stirs up countertransference, whatever you want to call it. it this is trans-theoretical. Every model says that it's important that therapists are able to stay self-reflective uh, while they're helping uh, challenging clients. We're gonna both build your skill to do it, but then also keep an eye on building your capacity to do it with clients that you might have particularly strong reactions with. Now, typically we would do this, if I was working one-on-one -on -one with you, we'd do this with uh, videos of your own therapy session. So I know not everyone has that. So what I've done is uh, found some YouTube videos that you can use to kind of simulate a therapy session. So here, I just put a link in the chat window. If you can open that up and hit pause, because it might just start automatically. Open that up and hit pause. Now, I, it works best if you have headphones, but you don't need it. Remember, no one else can see or hear you. So don't, you're gonna look strange doing this exercise. Don't worry, no one else can hear you. If there's someone else in the room, you might wanna ask them to leave because you're gonna look a bit odd doing this. Um, I'm gonna set the video volume to low, okay? So you can just barely hear what's going on. You're not gonna, uh, can't open the link. Try uh, copying, pasting, or put it in a different browser window. Um, there might be some virus uh, stopping software that's stopping it from happening or something like that. Um, so uh, set the volume to low, and then I'm going to ask you to uh, talk out loud to the video. This is going to feel strange, but it's important. Uh, I'm going to ask you to monitor your inner experience as the video plays, and I'm going to guide you through that, all right? If this feels too hard, if your anxiety goes up over a threshold that's too much, feel free to pause, you know, look away, do whatever, you know, you got to do. You can pull up a video of uh, kittens or, you know, what, whatever you need. All right. Um, so let's, when I say three, when I say go, let's start the video and I will ask you questions. Remember, keep the volume low. All right. And look at the video, not me. So, ready? One, two, three.
three, go. Now notice any sensations in your body right now and say them out loud to the video. Now notice any thoughts in your mind and say them out loud to the video. Now notice any emotions, say them out loud to the video. Now notice any sensations in your body and say them out loud to the video. Notice any thoughts in your mind, say them out loud to the video. Notice any emotions, say them out loud to the video. All right, and pause the video. Great, great, excellent. If you could please uh, type in, if you feel comfortable to the chat window, did that feel easy, medium, hard? Uh, you know, you don't have to reveal anything super personal, just how did that, how difficult did that feel? To, to be aware of your inner experience as the video played. And uh, Susan wasn't able to open the link. I'm sorry, Susan, if you're, Accessing it from a mobile device, like a phone or iPad, that might be the uh, reason. Um, if you have anyone around you who could help, uh, there you go. Try hitting Alt-Tab to switch screens. So did that feel easy, medium, or hard? Now this is what we're asked to do as therapists, um, is to stay self-aware so we don't get carried away or get reactive uh, while our clients are having very emotional, kind of confusing uh, experiences. So uh, Cindy said, not difficult, more the physical feelings hard to feel or articulate right easily. Easy at first, but got harder. Great, great. So you, you notice that something, some aspects of the inner experience can be easier or harder. And then the challenge changes as it goes on. Okay, now I want to highlight that. That's a really important observation. So I just put in a second link. If you could go ahead and open the second link and then hit pause. This is uh, from the movie Goodwill Hunting. Now we're going to try this again. This, this clip some people find more difficult uh, because it involves a bit of pushback from the client, though not everyone. It's very personal. So I'm going to give you a moment to, to put it to open up this YouTube video. And then uh, we'll go through and we'll do the exact same um, thing. I, I will just say, uh, I'll, I will uh, cue you like I was cueing you uh, before. Now, you might notice that when I cue you, you, have, you get frustrated or annoyed with me. That's okay. That's not a bad sign. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right, so here's the second video. One, two, three, go. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts in your mind? Remember to say them out loud. Any emotions? Say them out loud. Any sensations in your body?
Any thoughts? Any emotions? Any sensations in your body? All right, great, let's pause. Now, uh, please type in the chat window, did that feel easier, the same, harder than the first video clip? For me, this one's a little harder because the, the client's pushing back. And this is something I've, I've struggled with is how do I help clients? How do I maintain my self-reflective capacity when there's some uh, complex feelings, you know, some anger, frustration in the, in the uh, relationship? Um, could not hear anything. Uh, let's see, Valeria, maybe try turning the volume up a little higher. Uh, yeah, seeing Robin Williams can be harder because of uh, his suicide. That was, that's definitely... Um, oh, it sounds like a bunch of people had volume issues. So it, we're going to try it again in a moment. And you can turn the volume up. That's okay. It's interesting. People are having no sound here. Uh, I, go ahead and, and raise the volume a bunch on it when, when we do it again. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to do it again and see if it feels different than the first time. Particularly, did you do you notice any more or less uh of any of these experiences. All right, so I'll count to three. One, two, three, go. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts? Any emotions? Say them out loud. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts? Any emotions? Say them out loud. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts? And any emotions? Let's pause. Great. So, uh, what did you notice? Did it? Did you notice new things the second time around? Did it seem easier, medium, easier, medium, uh, the same, harder? What, what did you notice? Um, now, this is a key component to deliver practice. Now, typically in clinical supervision, we just cover kind of what you're supposed to do, and then we move on to the next thing. With deliberate practice, you're actually practicing a skill repetitively. And what you'll find is as you do something repetitively, you, the experience of it changes. And it's almost like your body is learning to perform it even as you get tired, even as you get distracted, even as you get grumpy, even as, you know, everything. Uh, and so uh, Valeria said it can be more clear. So sometimes you get more clarity. Sometimes I actually get less clarity over time. But you know what, this is what happens during a therapy session. How often do you sit with a, a client and you actually are getting less clear about what's going on as the session proceeds? This is why it's important to do the repetitive practice. So you're, it's almost like your, your body is learning how to, uh, how to perform the skill. So let's go ahead and try the hardest uh, level of, or a harder level of uh, video. This is not the hardest level, but it's definitely a harder one. I'm gonna put it in here, here's the, the third link. Now, this video um, contains uh, some violence. 
not towards people, but, uh, or at least not towards other people. Um, and so uh, I, if it's too stimulating, if it's too much, just feel to pause it, turn it off, that kind of thing. But what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same exercise with a video that many people experience a strong reaction to. Uh, and it, it's not as long, but, but even still. So I'll give you a moment to load it and then we'll, uh, we'll start and I'll ask you the same questions. Now pay particular attention to any uh, urge to avoid your inner experience. That's called experiential avoidance, that's super important. Uh, also pay any particular attention if you have any complex feelings towards me, frustration, annoyance, that kind of thing. So uh, let's start on three. One, two, three. Do you notice any sensations in your body? Any thoughts in your mind? Any emotions, say them out loud. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts, any emotions, say them out loud. Any sensations in your body. Great, let's pause. So that was shorter, uh, but did anyone notice an urge to avoid the stimulus? right? Kind of a, an avoidance search. If so, uh, that is not bad. Uh, that means you have a functioning limbic system. Congratulations. Um, uh, however, it is important that we observe that urge because we have the same urge with clients when they are expressing very painful material. Did that one feel harder for anyone than anyone else? Now, um, how was this different than traditional supervision? First of all, we were focusing on a specific skill, right? We weren't talking about the theory. We're using repetition and then also certain speed or pacing where we're keeping it going, right? Now, if we had stopped every 20 seconds to talk about the theory of when it was written about in this journal 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been building our capacity to use it in challenging situations. Yeah, Melissa said, uh, anger is harder, and I, it's harder for me as well. I, I'm guessing for many of the people here, anger is one of the harder emotions to, uh, to, to really uh, to stay attuned with when it shows up. Uh, yes, and it was more visceral. Um, we're uh, learning through immediacy, which means we weren't talking about what happened last week or planning for what we're going to do next week, but we're uh, acquiring the skill in the moment, uh, right away in the moment. Um, Let's see what I'll hold on a second here. Um, hold on one second. Great. Uh, you might have noticed that it felt hard. Yes, deliver practice can be quite a bit harder than traditional supervision. Uh, now, did anyone notice complex feelings towards me? I mentioned that a few times. Now, you don't have to write it in the chat window if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. Um, now, let me ask you another thing. Uh, did, uh, so Patricia didn't, okay. Uh, did you, uh, do you remember ever feeling complex feelings towards your athletic coach or your music teacher? Right, when your coach said, let's do another few laps around the field, or your music teacher said, do it again, do it again. Now, does that mean that they were doing a bad job? No, it means if they could handle the complex feelings, if you could handle it, it actually meant they were, they were doing a good job. This is something that's not talked a lot about in psychotherapy training. But when you're doing, when you're working at your skill threshold, at your capacity threshold, there's a natural rise of complex feelings, frustration, annoyance, anger towards the supervisor. Look, when I see my personal trainer at the gym, uh, I am psyched to see her at first, but you know, two minutes into doing push-ups, I am not super happy that she is there. Now that that's that doesn't mean she's doing a bad job. It's just a natural thing. So we want to be aware of that. 
Now, the last way that this is different than traditional supervision is it involves homework. So let's talk about homework. Um, the way this would work is we would try to find which video was right at your uh, skill threshold and your capacity threshold. Now it's gonna be different for each person. Depend the first video had a lot more to do with grief, which honestly for me is a lot harder to handle than anger, which is a you know, second or third one. Um, and you'd find it of stimulus. It could ideally be your own session videos, but it could also be a YouTube video that's at your threshold. And then you do 20 minutes of this exercise um, between uh, consultation sessions. And you'd see over time, is your skill in your self-reflective capacity, uh, self-reflection, and is your capacity to, to use it while there's a strong stimulus going up, right? This is not about learning about it more. This is about, is your actual skill and capacity increasing over time, right? And then we would check in regularly with your uh, deliver practice coach. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and you'd keep adjusting the exercises to make sure you stay at your skill threshold and at your capacity level. And you'd want to just gradually keep increasing them. And it'd be tightly customized to you. you Note, this is totally different than going to a weekend workshop where you're learning a lot about a model, which is theory. You're watching a lot of someone else's videos with their clients, so you're learning a lot about their skill threshold. But it's not really customized. This is entirely customized to you. Right? You also notice that this is relatively trans-theoretical. You could, you could work on skills as they're defined by various models, uh, but um, you're also building capacity, which is totally trans-theoretical. Any questions about this as we're moving ahead? Uh, Cindy asks, are we trying to understand the client experience of emotion intense material and helping them get that it can deal with destructive deal with this and develop constructive ways to handle those intense feelings. So that is actually a separate skill, what Cindy just uh, said. Cindy actually listed two different skills. One skill is trying to understand the client's experience. So that's a skill, attuning with a client. That's not easy always. And then two, helping them get that they can deal with this and develop constructive ways to, that's a whole different set of skills. Right? So how to work with clients that are having these experiences. I am actually talking about a different skill entirely. I am saying, regardless of helping the client, can you stay self-reflective while the client is having a very provocative experience? Even if you're unable to help the client, can you at least stay self-reflective while it is going on? Because I found that I couldn't with clients that would have really intense grief or very strong anger, particularly at me, I couldn't stay self-reflective. I would kind of tune out, I would detach, I would freeze, I'd start arguing with them. So you notice what we're discovering is there's many different skills, each of which we should practice separately. Uh, yeah, Melissa says, and Melissa, if you could change it to, uh, above where you type in the chat, if you can set it to all panelists and attendees, I'm going to copy and paste your uh, chat so everyone can see it. Uh, Melissa said, we were talking about our, our ability to tolerate intense feelings. Yes. Because guess what? Uh, our clients have intense feelings. You know, it's kind of like we're trained to be fire, uh, you know, firemen or firewomen, uh, but not uh, given practice on how to handle fear. <laughs> You know, uh, it's, uh, it, we, we have tough jobs. We have to handle really intense feelings. It's almost like we're, I'm like a fire, a therapist is a fireman that goes into a room to save someone while the house is burning down. Uh, but the person you're trying to save says, you know, and you're like, let's go out the door. And they say, uh, I don't, I don't want to go out that way. I don't like that way. And you say, let's go out the window. And they say, oh, I'm scared of heights. And you say, uh, well, you know, what way do you want to get out of the building? And the, the person says, well, I, you know, I don't know if I trust you yet. How about we spend a few weeks talking while the house burns down to see if I can trust you before we then talk about a way out of the house. All right. That, that is what we are being asked to do is sit in an emotionally, the emotional equivalent of a burning building in a tune with someone face to face a few feet from us who's watching us very closely for any second of, uh, you know, detachment or misattunement and experience all the things they stir up. And we're being asked to do that without practicing building capacity. You can't acquire that capacity from reading books. You just can't do it. 
And so therapists can't do it and then they feel bad about themselves because they think everyone else can do it. But the truth is, is almost no, none of us can do it. Some of us can write papers about doing it, but we don't have the capacity to actually do it with very provocative clients. So this is about building that capacity. Um, question, when you say gets too much anxiety ways, if you breathe deeply, you're straight. Yeah, so uh, if you're able to like keep breathing and you feel like you're, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in control, right? You're, you're feeling some activation, but you're in control, that's okay. What we're watching out for if you start getting nauseous, if you start, um, you know, if you get constipated, if you start disassociating, that means you've probably gone too much anxiety. Another question from Ryan. Being in these moments of intense counter-transference with typical training, does this not always help? Ah, okay. So this is a really important question Ryan asks. Uh, Ryan, I think you're saying when you're with clients and having intense counter-transference, doesn't that help, right? So let, let's get to that. That's a really good question. Um, let, actually, Ryan, ho hold on to that for a second, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. So uh, one thing I want to show you here is an example of the homework. So hold on a second. Okay. Oh, uh, whoops. This is actually somewhere else. So go to Go to this link. I just copied a link. And if that one doesn't work, you can also try this one. But go to, go to one of those two links, and what you'll see is an example of me doing delivered practice homework. Now, this is really important, because homework is where most of the skill acquisition happens in most other fields, right? Most other fields, the time with a teacher or coach is actually limited. But most of the acquisition, skill acquisition is going on many hours between when you see the coach. So go ahead and hit play on three. One, two, three. Now pause. Now let me tell you what I'm doing. So I've got a, a client video up on the screen. You can't see it there for confidentiality reasons. This is a client that uh, I found out was at risk of deterioration uh, through the kind of weekly uh, outcome monitoring software. And uh, Cindy, if you kind of try it a few times, it might, uh, it might work. Um, and uh, I recorded a session with the client's uh, permission and brought this session, the video to a consultant. And the consultant noticed that I had been ignoring the client's anxiety. That was actually very, very high. And which is strange because I, I know in my mind how to help clients with anxiety. Um, and uh, so uh, what I did was I uh, started watching the video of the client with the volume low, like I was asking you to do, and just practicing saying kind of anxiety help like saying anxiety regulation techniques to the client while monitoring my inner experience and the goal was to kind of use a video as a stimulus to flush out my countertransference and to behaviorally practice the intervention i was doing so let's watch again on three one two three Now, I want to emphasize, I am not following what's going on in the video. I'm not responding to the client in the video. Instead, I'm just kind of uh, talking kind of at the video as a stimulus. Now, as I do this, I'm monitoring my own countertransference that gets stirred up by the video. If there's any questions about this, please type them in the chat window. You notice I'm not saying the same thing robotically every time. I'm trying to stay flexible and attuned. Now, I would do this, uh, you know, a few times a week, 20 minutes at a time uh, for a few weeks. And I found over time, first of all, I discovered what the countertransference was that was really interfering uh, with my ability to help the client was that he reminded me a lot 
of what I was experiencing, what I experienced uh, as a teenager when I had a lot of dysregulated anxiety and I didn't know one around me was paying attention to it. Um, and so all this grief came up. I felt, you know, I cried a lot. And, and then the next time I sat with the client, I was able to attune with them a lot better. Um, so some of the things I'm saying to the, uh, uh, to the client are, um, to the video are, where do you notice anxiety in your body? How do you feel the anxiety in your body? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Great. So um, something I want to emphasize, when you're doing these homework or these exercises, um, the, uh, I'm sorry, some people are, are having technical problems, and unfortunately I can't help each person's technical problems because everyone's got a different setup, so I, I apologize for that. Um, you could always, uh, so this is being recorded. You could watch the webinar later after kind of restarting your computer, and sometimes that uh, solves it, so. Uh, something I want to emphasize is doing the homework um, and uh, uh, doing the practice is not about just kind of doing it right every time. In fact, we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to flush out mistakes. This is different because when you're in supervision, you're trying to get it right. So you pass supervision, so your supervisor likes you, right? So they sign off your your hours. This is totally different. In deliberate practice, you're actually trying to like flush out your mistakes. You're trying to kind of make as many mistakes as you can before you see the client. It's a very different model of learning. Um, so uh, any questions, please, non-tech related questions, please put them in there. So uh, I uh, want to emphasize something else, uh, which is that uh, deliberate practice is not the same as work performance. This goes to the question Ryan had about, well, you know, we just get lots of hours working with our clients where we have counter transference. Doesn't that help? The trick is, is when you have a live client in front of you, you're not able to repetitively practice the same skills or techniques. You're not able to try to flush out all your mistakes. You're not able uh, to kind of experiment, you know, in ways that you think that might not be appropriate with a client. It's um, uh, Valeria asked, would this be helpful to do as peer supervision? Absolutely. Yeah. So work doing this with peers is one of the best ways to do it. Um, uh, thank you, Patricia, for that. Uh, and yeah, some supervisors have done this. Uh, and oh, you're saying you, you supervise, uh, yeah. So occasionally supervisors will do this, but mostly we're not doing this across the field. Um, you know, most of us here have hundreds or thousands of hours of work experience. Uh, unfortunately, well, let's put it this way. You know, I got my driver's license about three decades ago. Uh, I have thousands and thousands of hours of experience driving. However, I am very probably not a better driver than I was three decades ago. In fact, I'm likely a little bit worse. I even get good feedback on my driving from my wife. She's able to predict my mistakes often before I even make them. But I don't practice the corrective skills. I'm not, I'm not building my skills through exercises and not building my capacity to drive better in challenging situations like rain or dark or traffic or something. I'm getting a lot of hours of performance, but no hours of practice. This lets me uh, maintain a level of competence, though some might argue I'm not a very competent driver, uh, but it will not turn me into a professional driver, I'll tell you that. Um, uh, and uh, let, let me just go ahead, we're getting some really good questions here, but I just want to uh, move ahead for one second before I go to these. Um, Noticing this has led some prominent psychologists to raise a question of, are we a field without expertise? Uh, now this uh, question has not been embraced by everyone in the field. I would put it more diplomatically. I'd say uh, we might be a field that's pre-expertise. You know, psychotherapy has only been around for a little over 100, you know, 100 years ago, Freud was still doing his thing. Um, it took other fields centuries to figure out how to practice. Um, and I think we're just starting now. So I, I'd say we're actually ahead of the curve. Um, but something to uh, emphasize here, hold on one second here, uh, is that uh, the passive learning and work performance only helps you achieve and maintain competence. And I'd argue that most therapists are competent. You know, 50% success rate across the field, I, I think for healthcare is pretty good. Uh, however, in most fields, that will not be sufficient to attain a professional level of performance. 
Um, so uh, Cindy asked, any way to measure or assess our improvement? Um, there are measures. I'm just starting to figure those out. If you email me separately, I'll, uh, I'll let you know about that. Um, and uh, Melissa asked, says, I can imagine having a session where I know I had countertransference, but not knowing the key emotion underlying it. Would watching the video and over and over again without knowing the core emotion at first eventually help sort it out in the same way? So two, so two thoughts on that. First of all, yes, watching the video over and over again without, because you don't have, you see, when you have a live client in front of you, you have to know what to say, like moment to moment to moment. I mean, I think people, we underestimate the performance demands of what we do. We, we do a performance art, like not an art, like it, you know, totally creative. It's based in science, but we're doing a performance skill. We're not doing philosophy. We've got, it, it's an audience of one or maybe a couple or a small family, but they are watching us moment to moment, extremely tightly, constantly assessing, do we understand them? Do we like them? Are we attuning with them? Are we being helpful for the entire time? I, I mean, this is really tough. What we do is more like improvisational acting or stand-up comedy, but with like an audience of one that's an, an, often in intense distress, often ambivalent about being there, uh, and is sitting like right in front of us. It, it's a lot, it's really, really hard. And so being self-reflective while performing in that way is just really hard. So yeah, so sitting with a video, you don't have the performance demand so you can actually uh, have a better chance of figuring out what's going on. That said, it's not necessarily required for you to understand your emotion. What is necessary is for you to be able to experience it in a way that you don't go into uh, avoidance, right? Where you don't shut down or detach or start arguing with the client or all the things I've done, <laughs> all right? I mean, we have all kinds of inner experiences we never fully understand and, and that's okay. We can still be very helpful. It's just important that we don't kind of react in an unhelpful way. So, um, so let's see, other questions, these are great questions. I really appreciate the questions everyone's asking, so please uh, keep them coming. I wanna privilege your questions. So there have been studies uh, recently, which unfortunately uh, suggests that therapists do not just improve with time in the saddle. Studies of both trainees on the left and experienced therapists on the right, and the lines represent the different therapists in the study. On the study on the left, there's, there were 114 trainees, we just showed four of them as samples. You know, some of them got better over time, though a lot of them got a bit worse. Uh, and you notice on the right, there's therapists with a, up to 18 years of experience. Uh, some got better over time, but some got worse. And then on average, they basically stayed flat, which is what we'd expect for uh, any field that you're performing in. Uh, if you just kind of, you know, do it for 20 hours a week and you're not deliberately practicing at your skill threshold, specific skills, you'll just kind of maintain a level of competence, which isn't bad. I mean, that's, you're still helping a bunch of people that, that, you know, nothing to feel bad about. But if you want to get better, it involves a deliberate practice on specific skills at a specific threshold, ideally with, uh, you know, expert feedback. Um, so... Let's see. So before uh, everyone gets demoralized, sometimes when I give workshops, I could just see people's like faces crashing. Um, this is actually good news because what this means is that you are not the problem. It means that because I used to think I was the problem. I was like, I'm reading, all, you know, when I go to workshops, everyone says this is empirically supported therapy. It has this tremendous support, you know, success rate. Or, you know, the experts would say they have zero deterioration rate, which is like bogus. Or you know, no one was talking about their mistakes, and so I thought it was all my fault. It wasn't all my fault. It's just that our training methods are really limited, right? I was no better at therapy than I could expect to be, you know, better at playing, you know, the accordion without doing deliberate practice, right? So uh, th there's a real potential here. So uh, Scott Miller, pictured here, I'm sure many of you uh, know him or know of him, uh, was the first psychologist to really promote the idea of using deliberate practice uh, for uh, psychotherapy training. Uh, he and Daryl Chow, a, a, a very uh, talented psychologist uh, from Singapore, did a study uh, that replicated Erickson's study where they asked a bunch of trainees to uh, fill out diary cards on their training activities. They sorted the diary cards 
by the skill of the therapist as measured in client outcome. I want to emphasize this. You know, there's some who think that skill of a therapist should be measured by adherence or competence in a model, which, I mean, <laughs> what I want my, how I want my therapist to assess their skill is, am I getting better, <laughs> right? Not are they doing the treatment right, but am I getting better, <laughs> all right? So that's how I assess my skill as a therapist. Um, and they found that the best therapists uh, had engaged in the most deliberate practice activities. If you have any questions, please uh, put them down here. So let's go ahead and let's try this one more time. Um, and let's go ahead and do the Goodwill Hunting video again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it in here and hopefully there won't be too many uh, technological problems. So here's the link. And remember the goal here is just to notice your inner experience, that's it. S saying it out loud helps the kind of noticing process, having a behavioral component. All right, and I'll ask you the questions. So on three, one, two, three, go. Notice any sensations in your body. Notice any thoughts in your mind. Say it out loud. Any emotions, say them out loud. Any sensations in your body. Any thoughts? Any emotions? Say them out loud. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts in your mind? Any emotions? Great. Pause. Now, uh, if, if you feel up to it, type in, did it feel easier, the same, harder? Did you notice anything different? Ideally, we're noticing a little more each time we do it. Sometimes what I notice is a little more is like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to feel this. Like, I'm sick of feeling this. And that's good to notice because <laughs> that definitely happens with clients. I wanna emphasize here, we're not trying to change our inner experience. We're just trying to notice it. Ah, Livia said easier to identify emotions. So sometimes this comes fairly quickly. Uh, when there's videos that I don't have a lot of strong counter-transference with, um, it, uh, it, I, I can pick it up pretty quickly. So here again was the third video. This is the video with the angry wrestler. Um, and let's try this one again. Uh, I'll give you a moment to load it. Remember, this is a shorter one. And uh, we'll do it on three, same process. Remember, don't try to change what you're experiencing, including if you want to avoid it. Just notice it and say it out loud. All right? All right, on three. One, two, three, go. Any sensations in your body? Any thoughts in your mind? Any emotions?
Any sensations? Say them out loud. Any thoughts in your mind? Any emotions? Okay, pause. Great. If you feel comfortable, if you could type in, did it feel easier, the same, harder? Uh, what? Um, I, I, how did that feel? Okay, so what I want to do here is I want to share. So I know we're doing something hard here. So I'm going to share a, a, a pin with you. Uh, this is a, a fun pin I, I found online um, because it's hard because what you're doing is really hard here. Um, and uh, it, you should give yourself a reward for it. So uh, these are pins I hand out at my workshops. Um, so, um, all right. So let me, let me switch back to, uh, where are we, where are we here? Okay. So great. Um, Okay. Uh, okay. So again, we would, uh, oh, great. Livia said, uh, tried to distract myself this time around. Exactly. So this is super important. The moment you notice your urge for experiential avoidance, that's your threshold right there. Now, if you can work right below at that level, you will gradually increase your capacity. Right? Now, for different people, it's different things. Uh, you know, it's different stimuli, different movies. Uh, it, but ideally, it's client videos, clients that, that you find very challenging. But the goal is to find your specific threshold. This is very different than just like memorizing a model. Now, models are super important. But to, to use the model with challenging cases, you also got to do this. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, so if you want to experiment with this, this is how I recommend it. You know the, this quote here, you want to know the difference between a ma master and a beginner. The master has failed more times than the beginner has tried. That's the goal. The goal is to help you fail more time, as many times as possible before you have a client in front of you. I would aim to do this uh, uh, once a month in uh, 15 to 20 minute segments, just sitting watching your own videos or videos or movies. Um, I schedule an hour. Uh, to end up doing 15 or 20 minutes because, you know, I have to like shut down email and get coffee and all that. Ideally, you're working with an expert coach who's an expert in whatever model of therapy you're using, and they're customizing exercises specifically at your thresholds. So that really helps a lot. It also can help to team up with a buddy, as someone said earlier, to, uh, to do this as kind of a peer consultation thing. Um, and I, I just want to prep you, you know, some people are like, oh, this can be so easy. So it's actually, it's a lot harder than, than many people think. You know, there's a reason why we spend our time reading books and going to workshops is because we're, it's not emotionally challenging. This is aiming at a very emotionally challenging uh, uh, area. All right. So, um, so let's review. And if there's any questions here, please, uh, please uh, let me know. We're coming up on nearing the end of the webinar, so I want to prioritize your questions if you have them here. Uh, I want to emphasize here the difference between a clinical supervisor and a coach. So normal clinical, traditional clinical supervision is you go, you talk about your case, or you show the video, and the supervisor says, oh, well, this is what I would do differently, the X, Y, Z. And then you're like, oh, you write it down, you think about it, and then you try to do it the next session. That is kind of client focused, okay? Now that, that's important. But that's different than deliver practice. Deliver practice is more focused on how do you acquire that skill or capacity to do that thing. So it's a lot more demonstration of a skill, rehearsing a skill, working right at your capacity threshold, right? So traditional supervision is client focused. You could say workshops and reading are therapy model focused. Deliver practice is therapist focused. It, it's a big difference. Now, the other two are very important. We don't want to let go of the other two, but we also want to bring in this third. We want to have a therapist focus so we know our skill threshold, our capacity threshold, and our particular methods of uh, acquiring the, those skills. It's like a meta-awareness of the process. Um, so Ryan asked a really important question. Have I noticed a difference in my outcomes as I've done more delivered practice? So I have noticed a difference at the end of one client level. So I've had a, a, quite a few clients that were uh, at risk of dropping out, 
deteriorating, where I got their consent, I videotaped a case, I showed it to an expert, I got feedback, and then I did a bunch of deliver practice on the skills that then helped, and those cases turned around, and they had very successful outcomes. Um, what I unfortunately don't have is kind of the, the larger scale res, uh, results of my outcomes over time. So I've tracked my outcomes for the past half dozen years. I've got them on my website. You can go see them. Um, but I keep moving around in different locations. So it's really hard to tell uh, if my outcomes are improving over time because each new location kind of starts it over again. So I'm hoping that I'll be here in Seattle uh, forever. My wife just put in for tenure here at University of Washington, so check back with me in a few years. Um, but this is really important. This, the question Ryan is implying, which is, does deliberate practice uh, uh, help? And the question is, no, it does not always help, right? So if I just, I've never played golf, but if I just go to a, a golf field or whatever it's called and just start whacking balls, uh, I, I'm not necessarily going to get better, right? If I just pick up an accordion and just start playing, I, I'm not necessarily going to get better. For deliberate practice to really help, it has to focus on the correct skill. It has to be at a threshold. I have to practice it correctly, get feedback, all that kind of stuff. And this is really, really important. We don't want to just assume that just because we're doing something, we're getting better. All right? Of course, we also want to raise the same concern about clinical supervision and workshops and continuing education, <laughs> which is they do not reliably improve clinical skill. I think... Every method of training should be subject to a more empirical test. Um, and here's a list of questions for research in case we have any researchers on the line. Um, uh, I, I can send you the slides. So I, I want to uh, repeat again. If you email me when the webinar is over, I'm happy to send you these slides and you can use them, you know, however you want in the, in the future. So there are a few challenges to deliberate practice we should review, which is that it requires time, energy, you know, money for consultation, that kind of thing. Typically, we don't have a lot of that in excess. Um, so it's important to, uh, to really re to stay grounded in your motivation. It's particularly important to find what's called a harmonious passion. That means you're doing it because you love it. It can be frustrating. Sometimes you can hate it. But overall, you love it. You're not doing it because, like, Oh, if I don't do this, I'm going to hate myself, right? That's called obsessive passion. I've tried that in the past and it didn't work too well. There's a great uh, quote by a Scandinavian researcher, um, Neeson Lee, love yourself as a person, doubt yourself as a therapist. Meaning, uh, you know, uh, maintain a certain professional self-doubt, uh, even though you love yourself as a person. Any other questions, please put them in there. So there's some resources if you want to learn more about this. Uh, I've uh, got a website. Scott Miller uh, has written a lot about it, uh, the ICE website. Daryl Chow has a cool Facebook page. Uh, the link is there on the screen. Um, Frontiers of Psychotherapist Development, he talks about it. And then John Fredrickson also has some really cool resources about this uh, as well. Uh, on my website, uh, DP for Therapists, there's also information about recording therapy, tracking therapy outcomes, uh, that kind of thing. I also have an email list where I post um, uh, new experiments uh, as, I, as I develop deliver practice exercises. Uh, I kind of beta test them uh, through the list. So uh, let's see, let's move through this quickly. This is where I do my outcomes on my website. You know, what I'd like to do here is because we've uh, seen some uh, challenging videos. What I want to do, hold on one second, um, is uh, okay. What I'd like to do here is go to uh, hold on one second. Okay, so here's another video to go to here. Whoops, sorry, that didn't come up. One second. Um, here it is. Let's see if this one comes up. This is a video here. We're going to do the same exercise, uh, but we're going to do with this video. This is kind of like a cool down, 
right? So you know when you do a, a workout, um, it's important to kind of have a cool down, right? You don't want to just end abruptly. And it's the same with deliberate practice. Because we've been doing something hard, we want to kind of, you know, cool ourselves down emotionally. So this is a, a video I use for cool downs. It's from a Lord of the Rings. I, I know it's kind of nerdy. That's how I am. But it, it's, a, it's a cool cool down video. So uh, I'll count to three and we'll start. And I'll ask you the same questions, all right? On three. One, two, three, go. So notice any sensations in your body. Notice any thoughts in your mind. And notice any emotions in your heart. Any sensations in your body. Any thoughts in your mind. And any emotions. Great, let's pause. So we've got uh, a moment here towards the end. Any, uh, any last questions? So as you think about and uh, write, type in your questions. Um, so I, I do this webinar a lot. I do similar workshops. I do them around the world. Uh, they're listed on my website. Um, and uh, I, I really, really, really value your feedback on uh, how to improve uh, this webinar. So if you can send me an email with feedback, uh, I will give you a free webinar in the future or somehow I will make it worth your, your while. Um, the, the, let's see, here's a question. So do you approach deliberate practice the same for trainee, novice, intermediate, experienced therapists? Great question. Are there different approaches for people at different levels? So uh, ideally, deliberate practice is highly individualized. Now, there might be trends. So for beginning trainees, we might work on more basic skills, like how do you do a reflection, right? Uh, how do you just kind of start therapy? And with more advanced therapists, it might be more kind of subtle, complex, harder skills, like managing countertransference or something. However, with everyone, ideally, it's very individualized. Uh, now, this is tough today because, you know, there's uh, a bunch of people in the webinar. I don't know, you know, most of you I don't know. I can't see your reactions face to face. So I'm just kind of putting out exercises and hoping they're roughly in the ballpark for you. But ideally, it's tightly individualized to the person. Um, so, uh, so, yes, it is. Uh, it's different, not just by experience level, but by individual. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, so any other questions? It's a great question. Please uh, put them in. Um, so yeah, if you email me, you can, uh, I've listed some uh, sample questions here on the screen um, that you can send to me. Um, uh, but, or you could just send an email with your thoughts or ideas, but uh, I will definitely send you something back that will make it worthwhile. And I really, really, really appreciate your feedback. Uh, and if you ever uh, want um, to see a workshop, they're listed, uh, on my uh, on my website. Um, let's see what else here. So uh, again, just to say thank you, thank you, you're welcome. Uh, I would like to um, hold on a second. I would like to uh, again thank uh, George Tasca and PPRN PPRNet for. Um, bringing me on today and uh, organizing this. This has been really uh, great. It's a wonderful group. You've had some really good questions here. Um, and uh, thank you. You're welcome, everyone. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, uh, stay tuned. We're, we'll do, uh, do hopefully more and more as time, uh, as time goes on. So, and email me if you have any questions uh, about this at all. So, um, I'll give another second if anyone has any last questions, but otherwise we will sign off for now.
Uh, you're welcome, Jean. Uh, you're welcome, Valeria, Ryan, uh, Maria, Livia, Sandra. <laughs> Patricia, this is really great. All right, cool. Well, thanks, everyone. And uh, I hope to see you in person sometime soon. All right. Bye.